Welcome back to the Untrained Unprofessional Shooting Range. I'm Nobody, and thanks for showing up. I appreciate it. Today, we're gonna to be finishing off the AR Barrel Bedding Series. It is currently already bedded, and I will show you that footage here in just a minute, just in case you wanna figure out how I did it and what my methodology was. And if you have other ways of doing it that works for you, great. This is just what I kinda of do, and I kinda of take it by a case by case basis. But I'll show that in just a second. All right guys, so have this taken apart as you can see, and I'm gonna go ahead and lap the face of this receiver. And I'm using Wheeler 600 grit. So I really don't wanna cut into it aggressively. I just want to square it off. That way the barrel extension has a nice flat surface to rest against. So just spreading that on the face. Give it a quick shot of a little bit of lube, so that way it'll float anything that's cut off. And I'm just doing even pressure. As you can see, at a high spot here. And you do want to be careful that when you have it clamped in a block like this, don't get too aggressive on clamping it because you can actually pinch the receiver against this. All right, we'll call that good. So I just went ahead and degreased everything off camera. Here's a uh, hopefully a better look at the uh, facing that we just did on this uh, receiver. And as you saw, it really didn't take a whole lot of time. So don't get too crazy while you're doing it. You just want to get down to where you start seeing shiny metal all the way around. And then it's going to be a nice, hopefully squared off receiver. So but degreased. Barrel extension is degreased. Now we need to talk about how we are going to bed. My personal preference, and you know, there are people who will do things differently and that's fine. What I like to do is use a combination of a stainless steel shim and the retaining compound. So I carry two different types of shim. I have a one thousandths and a 2000 shim. And both of these are made by Precision Brand. I bought these years ago and I still have plenty of it left over. Retaining compound, I'm gonna be using Loctite 638. And the goal is going to be to find out, and I got a feeling that if I'm gonna use a shim, it's probably gonna be the 1000, because this is fairly tight and that clicking is actually that pin rattling back and forth in the receiver but there's not a whole lot of play in this so it's a very very tight fit a reasonably tight fit and what I like to do maybe I should draw this hold on a second all right let's explain the method to my madness or at least what I'm trying to do this is your barrel extension here's the indexing pin and obviously this is your, you're looking at your chamber right here. And this is the stainless steel shim. I use a stainless steel shim in order to center the extension into the upper receiver. It creates a mechanical spacer that keeps the barrel from just wanting to sit at the bottom of the upper receiver. By doing that, it keeps the bolt in line with the bore axis and should help keep it more perpendicular to the bore axis as well. And that creates hopefully better lockup and better precision, accuracy, the whole nine yards. What I try to do is I cut the shim long so that way it wraps pretty much all the way around. I, I stop just short of the barrel extension and I try to fit it into the upper receiver. 
if it can fit and it's not super loose or loose enough that would require a 2000s inch shim, then I will install it as long as I can. If for some reason there is enough bind to where it starts crinkling up the shim, and it will crinkle because it's pretty thin stuff, you can cut this with a pair of regular household scissors. If it starts crinkling, then it is too tight. And what I'll do is I'll trim a little bit off, recenter onto the extension and try to fit it. So what you're seeing here is how much I had to trim off. Now I originally cut it to where it was probably covering about, here, let's get the light a little bit better. It probably came up about to where my fingers are but I had to cut a little bit off so that way it would slide in. Now I can fully seat this in right now. It's tight, but I could fully seat it in. What I'm going to do at this point, just to take up any potential voids and to create a nice secure uh, engagement, or not engagement, a nice secure bed for this barrel to sit into the receiver is I'm gonna put a little bit of Loctite 638, which is a retaining compound and that will expand and fill in any voids. And I'm gonna do it from right here. So I'm gonna put it on, and then as I'm fitting it in, it'll fill any voids and squeeze out any extra. And then I will take that extra off because I don't want it getting onto any of my threads. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put the barrel extension on just to keep it in place. So what I decided to do is put some lube here on the threads, just in case if there is a little bit of squeeze out of the retaining compound, I don't want it to adhere to the threads on the barrel extension because I'm just gonna snug this up, but I'm not gonna put a whole lot of torque Went ahead and put some anti-seize. I use a copper anti-seize. You can use whatever anti-seize that you like. And I'm gonna go ahead and get this tightened back down and I'm going to do it back to 30 foot pounds, which is what it was at before on the first uh, round of tests. And I wanna to try to keep everything as consistent as possible. So I'll go ahead and put it back together and I will see you out on the range. Freedom Munitions, I'm actually gonna do strings of five. So I'll do Freedom Munitions, the Fiocchi, and then the 77 grain AAC. That was loud. Now this is the unbedded barrel target that we saw in the previous video wanted to show that for a point of reference. Here is the bedded barrel target, and this is when I was just shooting off of the little rest and shows the averages, which are basically in line with the other target. And I'll show this better also, but I also wanted to show that I tried this with the Caldwell turret as well to see how much of a difference it would be just in case I am just, well, I know I'm a spaz when it comes to uh, steady shooting and I wanted to try to take myself out of this as much as possible. From left to right, we have the unbedded, bedded, and bedded with turret target. So on the bedded, we're looking at a group average of 2.059 with the bedded 2.046. And these numbers right here, let me break this down. So the, with the turret target had five shot groups. So the box is including everything. So 2.239, now if I drop the flyer, it's 1.619, make sense? Okay, so that was the Freedom Munitions. On the Fiocchi, 1.516. On the bedded target, 2.183 and then 
1.625 with flyer drop flyer 1.527. Now with this right here, the difference is I had a really tight group here on the unbedded target. And then I had a wide group there. So that was most likely me being a spaz. So that kind of explains why there's a disparity, but why this is going to be closer here. On the AAC, we're looking at 1.087, bedded target 1.38, bedded with turret 1.716 for the five shot group and drop the flyer 1.37. All right, so I just had to remind myself why I even started down this path to begin with. And it was all about the Brownells Smith Busters and whether you should bed your barrel to your AR-15 upper receiver. And so I rewatched it and just kind of confirmed a few things. And uh, let's talk about what they said and my own conclusions. All right, so first conclusion from the video is, is that with modern machining, it really isn't necessary to even consider bedding. And that's because the tolerances are so close and so controllable that you don't have to really worry about a lot of slop in the finished product. They do say that if you find, like let's say an upper receiver to where there is a lot of movement between the extension and the upper receiver, then you should just basically get rid of that upper receiver and buy a quality one. But I think there's a way to fix it. We'll talk about that in a minute. The next major conclusion that they kind of talk about, and they kind of get around to this, and it's about facing the receiver with a lapping tool. And ultimately, you know, it comes down to, you should check it and see if that face is concentric with a lapping tool. And if it is, you know, as, you've, as you get going on it and it's wearing evenly, then just stop what you're doing, don't even worry about it. But if you're getting high spots that are getting knocked down, kind of like what we found on this PSA, then you want to go ahead and finish facing it so that way it's nice and concentric to the bore. Now, the last major thing that they talk about, or at least that I thought was a major thing, and it's like you might find little things in there, you know, watch it, it's a good video. It's just like it, Trust me, they really like the idea of the interference fit. And what that is, if you saw my AR-15 upper build, and maybe I'll link it up here somewhere, it's when you take an undersized receiver and you have to heat it up so it expands so you can fit the barrel extension in. And then as it cools, it just clamps down on it. And they don't talk about why they like it. So I kind of had to draw some conclusions, you know, with my own thought processes. And first thing is, is that I think it keeps everything um, in line with the upper receiver. So it's like an, if you have an oversized receiver and your barrel sits low or at the bottom of it, then you're not truly in line with the overall receiver. So with an interference fit, it's going to want to center automatically. And, you know, I think that just makes the most sense personally. And, and if you came to a different conclusion, I mean, feel free to put it in the comments below. I challenge my idea, you know, it's like, I, I'm here to learn. That, that's the whole point of why I do this is because I like to learn. Um, but, you know, the other thing that I think about the reason why they like the interference fit and keeping everything in line with the bore is that it helps with the wear and life of all the parts that are involved. So if you think about it, it's like if you have things that are slightly off as they're rubbing together and hitting, you're going to establish an uneven wear pattern and that could affect the longevity of the part. And I would think that would also affect accuracy. All right, so my opinion, should you bed? And I'm going to say not in the traditional sense. So, the, or in the way that a lot of people do by using the Loctite. I think that if you're going to bed the barrel to the upper receiver, I think you should bed it in a way that mimics the interference fit. And what I mean by that is, like we saw earlier how I used a 
1,000 cent shim because you know that allowed me to actually get it into place. Well, maybe you should be using a 2,000 inch shim in this or in that scenario, heating up the upper receiver and creating that interference fit to make it more in line with the bore or the BCG and the bore more in line. Does that make sense? Probably complicated that more than I should. So I think that would probably be the better way of doing things, or at least in my mind. But we've all seen, you know, that sometimes my mind just doesn't work right. So something that I agree with the Smithbusters on is that the lapping tool, I think it should be used. And if anything, just to make sure that where your extension meets up with the, with the receiver face, that it is nice and flat and you don't have anything that is going to be out of square, which would affect accuracy. And lapping tools are cheap. All right, so my last opinion, and I think this is the one that you're probably gonna agree with most, even though I thought my other opinions were pretty good and the Smithbusters agreed with me on one of them, I, or I agreed with them. We'll just say I agreed with them. I sound more humble that way. So the last thing is, is that you should focus on the quality of parts that you're purchasing for your build or, or rebarrel or whatever you're doing. And the reason is, is that quality parts the attention to detail has been performed on those. So little things like the finished machining, the hand lapping, the polishing of the chambers, the matched bolts, all add up to the potential of greater accuracy. And I say potential because there's always gonna be that one, you know, that where you did it and it didn't work out. And so I gotta throw that caveat in there. So, but if you focus on the quality of your parts, of your components, then you are setting yourself up for better accuracy. And the only thing that you really have to worry about is what a crappy shooter you really are. And I say that based off of personal testimony. Those are my opinions and hopefully it helped. And yeah, leave comments down below. Let me know what you think or what you found. And I appreciate you guys watching. If you actually made it this far, wow, you have great staying power. Good job. Thanks, guys.